Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here and you enjoy horror stories, click subscribe and join us. Also, please could we get 1,000 likes in today's video? Thank you. I am your host. Let's begin. As a high school student planning her way through life, it was hard to do things independently. I had my parents, we weren't well off, but we had enough to survive. As for hobbies, well, there wasn't anything special about them. We didn't go camping or hiking with my father and his friends. My mother always ensured we had some routine that kept us moving and alive so we could eat and sleep at correct times. When we did have time off, we always went to one city or another to visit our relatives. There wasn't much else to it. I liked school a lot though. It was fun to study in the library, even if at times it was a bit boring. I enjoyed getting up early every morning, just to get started on my assignments before class began. You're probably thinking this sounds insane, they can't be speaking the truth right now, but I guess I regard myself as a bit of a nerd. I spent hours learning about different areas that were interesting to me. Living through life was hard enough, so I tried to make it easier so my parents never complained. My younger brother Sam was closest to me, and we were polar opposites. We spent time together after school. My mother never liked the idea of working after school. I did find a few jobs at a restaurant and a coffee shop, but I had to quit because mom found out I was working and got really pissed. Sometimes I feel it's selfish of her to decide what I do when I'm only trying to help, but I knew it was pointless arguing with her. Dad never says anything that goes against what she thought. I know it looks terrible, but knowing that he works hard, every day he goes to work. Whenever dad gets back and there is yelling, he goes back immediately. You can say he loves his peace of mind, and I was willing to give him that. One night he came home, mum and I were arguing about a job I found that wouldn't affect my school. I told her about it, but she wasn't willing to let me do it. We ended up yelling around the house. Later, when everything settled down, my dad came to my room and sat with me. I knew he had had much to say, so I stared at him and waited. I know you want to help, and I'm happy about that. I love you for that, but Maddie, leave everything for your mother. But I just want to help. It would be a lot easier if she let me, Dad. Maddie, listen to me. I know that you want to help, but it's not helping if every day I come home and both of you are screaming at the top of your lungs. It doesn't help anyone, and I hate to be the one to tell you what not to do. My dad muttered, his eyes were tired, and I decided to let everything slide. I decided to spend a lot of free time in school. I joined the art club there. I loved drawing and I found myself doing it better and better. I met a girl there called Chloe. Her hair was blonde, very long, and she was beautiful. She had big brown eyes and a big smile. She liked art as much as I did, maybe even more. She was also intelligent and hilarious to be around. The two of us hit it off fast. I also found myself joining a band, which was an exciting concept, seeing as I didn't really know how to play anything. I never liked the idea of music or singing, but I soon learnt some instruments, even though I was still pretty shit. After all, I learnt how to play piano when I was nine, but I forgot it, so it doesn't really count, and I only did lessons for a few months. Chloe and I played a few times together. She played the violin, which surprised me. I won't say that she was all too good, but I'm sure Chloe was better than me and our music teacher. Sam hung around with Chloe, and me a few times, mainly with others. That meant I wouldn't see him as often as I used to, 
I had to accept it. Even if I didn't like it, I was growing up, and he was getting older. Besides, we still hung out after school several times, sometimes during weekends. On Saturday, a family friend called Sarah asked me if I could babysit her little one, John. She only needed me for a few hours. Sarah told me that she had dinner plans with her husband, and he had been busy with work. This was Sarah's only opportunity to surprise him, as she had wanted to do this for two months now. I had to tell her I wasn't sure since mum was against me doing any work, and that I'd have to ask mum before giving Sarah a proper answer. Sarah was able to convince mum to allow me to babysit her son. I was angry for a while at first, but it went away the moment I went to Sarah's house. In my eyes, babysitting was an awful job, something that I didn't really want to do. They lived in a small suburban house just off the main street in town. Their family's lives revolved around work and church. They worked a lot because it paid well and they were pretty wealthy. John was 10, so it'd be easier to babysit someone that age, but I thought he would be too when she first asked me. Sarah asked about what I planned on doing with John, since it wasn't a school week. I had plans for dinner, and watching a movie of his choice, then perhaps we could play a board game before making sure that he got to bed by 9. Sarah loved the idea, and bid me bye bye as she ran to her husband's office. I turned to John, who just stared at me blankly. So, what do you want to do first, little one? Let's play a board game. I don't think I'm hungry just yet. We walked to the living room. John settled while I bought out a Scrabble board and placed it on the table. Do you know how to play? I asked John. He nodded. Timothy also knows how, he muttered while arranging the tiles. Timothy? Who's Timothy? Oh, a friend of mine. Then we fell silent as we started playing. John was very competitive, and played exceptionally quickly and effectively for his age. I had trouble keeping up with him to be honest. We laughed like crazy as we played. It was excellent spending time with a kid I almost knew as family. My mum knew Sarah and had known her for years, so I'm guessing that's the only reason why I was allowed to work as a babysitter. I haven't felt normal in a while. I was focused as I was taking care of John at the same time. It was difficult at first, but eventually I got better. John seemed to like Scrabble, and I guess it was a good way to kill time for me. We played silently until John suddenly asked, Can we watch a movie? I smiled, glad he'd taken his attention off this boring game. Sure thing, little buddy. What do you want to watch? Um, I don't know. Why don't I ask Timothy? John said. I stood there confused at what he said. Then John got up and ran upstairs. I was sure there was no one else in the house with us. I had been told it was just me and John. I followed John silently as possible. I got to his bedroom and peered through the slightly open door. I saw John staring at an empty corner and muttering something I couldn't hear. I'd heard a few times that he was mentally challenged and had learning disabilities, but I never took it as big deal, so I was worried. I slowly opened the door, trying my best not to make a sound. I didn't want to make him jump or run away or even worse, freak out. He looked terrified once he realised I was behind him and had entered his room. His hands were shaking, his head was ducked down. When I took a step closer, I saw his shoulders tremble, as if he was fitting. A lump formed in my throat, but I forced a smile on my face and asked, Everything alright little buddy? His head shot up immediately, his wide eyes fixed on me. The expression of his face was pure fear. His mouth moved slightly, his lips moved, but nothing came out. John? What's wrong? 
Timothy said he doesn't want to be my friend anymore, and it's all your fault. I didn't know if I should believe him or let him be. Why don't you come downstairs for dinner, John? We can sort this out later. I had never been told that John had an imaginary friend, and I guess some kids do, so although I knew he had learning issues, this definitely wouldn't come under that. At this point, I was slightly worried, just because of how his body was reacting. He was genuinely shaking and on the point of tears. He had become severely scared and depressed, because his imaginary friend had told him, supposedly, that they didn't want to be friends or need to be friends. I took John down and served him his meal. He seemed to calm down a bit. He took a lot of time trying to finish the meal. We never got to the movie part, as I was hoping that John was okay, I kept an eye on him the whole time. After dropping his plate in the sink, John told me he didn't want to watch anything and wanted to just go upstairs. I tucked him in and tried to read him his favourite book, but he declined. I felt terrible and I walked back to the living room thinking what the hell was wrong with him. I stayed up until it was dark outside. I heard John's bedroom door open, so I guessed he wanted to drink something or go to the restroom. I got up from the couch and walked over to the kitchen. There was a kid who was the same height as John. His brows furrowed as he stared at the counter. It wasn't John though. Who are you? How did you get in here? I asked as I stepped forward a little. The boy just stood, still facing the wrong way. I'm Timothy. I am John's real friend. You're not welcome in our house. Please can you leave? All of this was said in a demonic voice. He didn't look at me once or even turn around to acknowledge my presence. I genuinely felt so uncomfortable that I decided to call the mum Sarah. The whole time that I was on the phone, the kid just stayed stood in one place staring at the kitchen sink. I didn't know where John was, so I went upstairs to check on him. While the phone was ringing, sure enough, John was fast asleep lying in his bed. As I turn around, I'm absolutely shocked. I drop the phone, and Timothy stood right in front of me. Now, he looked a similar age, so he was a bit shorter than me. But he was so intimidating, and there was something freaky about him. One, he wasn't supposed to be there, I get that bit, but that wasn't even the most worrying part. This kid genuinely acted like a psychopath, some type of weird creep. Move, this is our room, you're not welcome he said in a monotone, strange voice. At this point, somehow I'd missed Sarah answering the phone, so tried to redial one more time. This time, Sarah answers. She seems annoyed, but also worried at the same time that I'm calling her in the middle of her dinner. I explained that there was a random kid in the house. He claimed his name was Timothy, and John had also been talking about him the whole evening. Or well, now, he was in the bloody house, I wasn't told about two, only one. Sarah goes silent over the line for a few seconds. Uh, who is it? Who? All I can hear is muttering on the other side as she talks to her husband to try and figure out whose of John's friends this is. She didn't recognise the name Timothy, but she said he had a few friends that lived down the road. She asked me to get the kid to leave and it clearly the kid had crept in thinking they were out to play or have a sleepover. I hung up, but afterwards she knew that I would deal with this. I was a responsible adult, so now it was my time to get this kid out of the house. They weren't supposed to be there. Eventually, I go back up to the bedroom, and the kid's not there. John is just fast asleep, and there's no sign of Timothy anywhere. I searched the entire house, and what's creepier about the whole thing is that the windows and doors were all locked, 
It was 9.30pm. I don't know how he got into the kitchen or how he left the house. After searching the whole property for ages, I could only come up with one believable reason of how this Timothy kid got into the property. In the parents' bedroom, they had an ensuite bathroom. There was a small window that was perhaps 20 inches wide and 20 inches in height. It was open, it was propped ajar slightly, but it wasn't on lockdown with the bolts in. That's the only fathomable reason I can think of how this kid got in, was he climbed through that window and climbed out when he left. It's still hard to believe, as he would have had to have climbed up on the ledge, and it would have been a very tight squeeze. When Sarah and her husband got back, they handed me the cash and mum picked me up. I didn't tell Sarah anything more than, oh yeah, sure, it was just one of John's friends from down the road. I sent him back home. In reality, my heart was screaming at me. This was the creepiest thing I'd ever had happen to me. It was genuinely terrifying, and the kid was only 10 years old. What made the whole thing worse was that John didn't even seem to be awake during the time that Timothy was there. The initial noise I'd heard must have been Timothy climbing through the parents' ensuite bathroom window. If I connect the dots, I can kind of lay out what I think happened, but I still can't make sense of why he was in the kitchen, and also why John never woke up to be with his friend. Friends at 10 should be happy together, smiling and laughing. John was petrified, John was scared of Timothy, saying that they no longer were friends. None of this makes any sense to me, and when I think about it over and over again, it boggles my mind worse every time. I'd grown up living with my parents in the state of Arizona, in a town called Chandler. I went through the school system like all the other kids. I liked sport, and the good thing was that girls' sports in schools had improved leaps and bounds since I first started. I represented the school in volleyball, swimming, and more recently soccer, which my dad was pleased about as I think secretly he wanted a boy, but I was a bit of a tomboy, and not very girly. As soon as I took up soccer, my dad started coming to support me, and we would really bond. Don't get me wrong, I still liked going out with mum to buy clothes, and as I got older we did pamper days together, so all in all, we all got on really well as a family. Mum worked in a real estate business and had her own company, which covered most of Arizona. Dad worked in accounting for a big company based in town. He also worked from home two days a week. Both earned good salaries, and Dad had been talking for over a year that he would like to move out of state to live. Mum had also said that she could do with a change having lived all her life since a child in Arizona. When mum and dad asked me how I felt about moving out of state, I told them I didn't really mind. Although I only had a handful of friends, I wouldn't say I was very connected to them. To me, it would probably be an exciting change for all of us. I was 18 years old by this point, and still didn't know what I wanted to do as a career growing up so maybe a new state would offer me new opportunities. The other thing that had just happened was that I had finished with my boyfriend last month, as we had just seemed to have drifted apart. Neither of us had cheated on the other, but the spark seemed to have just gone out, so we broke up on good terms and remained friends. So who knows, I said. Maybe a new area could throw up new relationships, friendships, 
and even a boyfriend who's a millionaire. Lol. Mum had the cheek to say to me, You wait in line, Lisa. If that's the case, Dad's history and I am off in a private jet, and then smiled. After a couple of months discussing a possible move, Dad said, I've been looking at a California and San Diego property. Mum said, yes, I've been looking at some of the websites and used some connections I've got through work in California. They seemed to be drifting more towards San Diego, which I guess was cool. I didn't know much about the place, but from what I'd heard, it sounded okay. Two weeks after we had this conversation, Mum and Dad took a long weekend and were doing a bunch of travelling. I suddenly realised that this weekend would be the first time I had been in the house on my own. After they left, I went out to do some clothes shopping in town. I got back about 3.30pm after a successful trip. I had eaten in town, so by the time I had put my new outfits away, I decided to go for a swim. We had a mini pool out back. I was floating around just relaxing, when I heard my cell phone ring on the pool table. I swam over and got out and grabbed a towel. I answered the phone and it was Dad. Dad was saying that he forgot to remind me of something. I said, what is it? He said, well, it's the 31st of October. It's Halloween. Don't you remember? When you were doing this with Mum and I and we used to take you round the neighbourhood houses and costumes. Ah, yes, I remember. Well, I stopped this around 15. Yes, that's right. But since then, Mum and I have dealt with all the trick-or-treaters who come to the door. We usually give them candy or some type of chocolate. So, guess what? As you're at home and we are not, you're the one that's going to have to answer the door tonight when the different groups of kids come round. You're going to have to try and find something and hand out sweets and candy. Mum has told me to tell you that there are some things in the cupboard up above the fridge. Dad then said, anyway, have a good evening and don't forget to put the battery pumpkin that's in the garage out by the front door. Switch it on, okay? Yes, Dad, don't worry about me. I'll fight off all the zombies and werewolves tonight. He laughed and said, see you Monday. I decided to go and take a shower and get dressed. After my shower, I decided to go and dig out my old horror makeup kit, which I had on top of my wardrobe. I soon had my face painted white, with the features of a skeleton painted on top. I wore a black top and black trousers. Then I whacked a pizza in the oven, as I decided I wanted to eat early before I started getting interrupted throughout the evening by trick-and-treat kids. Once I had eaten, I suddenly remember what Dad had said about putting the battery pumpkin out. I remembered it now it had glowing eyes, and Dad used to place it in the front door near the palm. I went out to the garage to try and find it. Eventually, after ten minutes, I saw it on top of the shelving by the artificial Christmas tree and Christmas decorations. It was too high for me to reach, so I grabbed a wooden box and placed it next to the racking and stepped up. I realised that I still could not reach it, so I stepped on my tiptoes and leant forward. Finally, I got it. Then I heard a noise and suddenly, before I knew it, I was falling. I remember banging my head on the way down, and then just total blackness. I came around on the floor, on top of a load of cardboard boxes, all crushed. They had old cloths and cleaning sprays. Luckily, they must have broken my fall, I thought. How stupid was I? Slowly, I got to my feet, feeling a bit dazed and dizzy. I held onto the shelving to guide myself. I looked at my watch and saw I'd been on the floor for half an hour. This was a bit worrying to me. Suddenly, I heard the front doorbell ringing, followed by trick or treat being shouted. I headed out the garage and entered the kitchen from the side door. 
I grabbed some sweets and headed for the door and opened it. Standing in front of me were four kids, around ten years old, three boys dressed as zombies with blood eyes, grey face paint and torn shirts, and there was a girl dressed as a vampire with very impressive makeup and white fangs. One of the boys said, I like your fake blood skeleton woman, pointing to my head. I said what, touching my head, feeling something sticky. Instantly I realised that I had blood on my fingertips. I had never added blood to my makeup. I did not try and explain, but instead placed our small bag of sweets into three of their collection pots. They said thanks, happy Halloween, turned and walked down off the drive. I shut the door and rest the other sweet bags by the front door on the table for the next lot that rang. Meanwhile I went and sat in the lounge as my head still hurt. I closed my eyes just for a minute, only for a loud knocking on the front door to reawaken me. I checked my watch, it was 8.30pm, I must have dozed off for an hour. Why the hell aren't they ringing the bell, I thought. No one knocks on doors if there's a bell button. Again, there were three loud knocks. As I approached the door, something inside of me became scared. As I got closer to the door, I felt a real cold draught come up from under the door that chilled me to the bone. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I stopped by the door just as the loud free knots came a third time. They seemed to echo around the hallway. I stepped forward and looked through the spy hole. All I saw was a tall black figure with a black hood, but I could not see the face from within. That's a very big kid, I thought. More like an adult trying to frighten people. I decided I wasn't going to answer the door this time, but as I went to turn away, the strangest thing happened. My right hand went to the door and unlocked it, and opened it, as if it had a mind of its own and I could not control it. It scared me to death. The door opened to reveal a large figure dressed in a long black cloak with a large black hood. They must have been at least six foot nine tall, and there was the strangest sickly smell. It was holding a very large, realistic looking sickle in their right hand. I tried to speak, but only a whisper voice came out. All of a sudden, I became so aware of my body. It was like I was in a nightmare and couldn't control anything. A part of me knew none of this was real, but another part of me thought it was. I could see this person, this figure stood in front of me wearing a hood. They were whispering to me, and I was trying to whisper back, but I couldn't. At this point, I was screaming in my own mind. I tried to let out a scream of my own, but couldn't. All of a sudden, I remember falling back, and that was it, just total darkness again. For however long, I don't know. I ended up waking up on the couch. I had concussion. Mum and Dad were bent over me. Mum had an ice pack on my head and also a bandage around the wound. It turned out I hadn't properly wiped it off and was dealing with serious concussion. They drove me straight to the hospital to have scans. Thankfully I did no damage falling down. But I was genuinely terrified and stuck in a nightmare that I couldn't control and felt so very real, all while I was home alone. I'd been at a football tournament all day. My youngest brother was playing in some team, and I remember being dragged along. I was 16 years old, 
Me and my family lived in the northeast of Great Britain. Is that what you call it? It has like four different names. The UK, United Kingdom, Great Britain, England, Britain. Yeah, it's just confusing. You get the gist. It was raining, absolutely pouring it down. And I just remember being stood at the edge of this field, thinking, what has my life come to? As a 16 year old girl, I was seriously starting to question things. I didn't really support my brother that much. Looking back on it, I feel kind of guilty saying that and bad. But I didn't have an ounce of interest in football at all. Not even one. We went back that evening, and my brother stunk of mud and wet dampness. I had to sit next to him, and at one point he thought it would be funny to rub his muddy shorts all over my clean jeans. Yeah, I really love my brother. It was after this that we got home, mum and dad announced that they were going out that evening. My brother had planned to go round for a sleepover to one of his friend's houses. His friend who was also similar age played in the same team as him. They were basically best friends and had sleepovers almost every weekend. My dad turned and looked at me and said, Well, unless you want to come with us, you can stay home alone. At this point, I didn't really care. I did think of the idea of going with mum and dad, but then I felt like I'd be a burden, as if I'd just be dragged along on their date. A bit weird. There's no way I was going with my brother to his friend's house for a sleepover, and I was kind of scared about staying home alone, but it wasn't too much of a deal to me. We lived in the edge of a town. Around a mile away was our aunt and uncle, and then another mile in the same direction were our grandparents. My grandfather died when I was eight years old, so I say grandparents, but it was our grandma. She lived alone and at the time was 84 years old. We used to take care of her. Me and mum would drive there most evenings to cook her some meals and just basically make sure she was okay. In the last few years of her life, things got really, really bad. Mum and dad were rushing to get ready. I remember it was a Friday evening and we'd just got back from the football match. I was just glad to be home, out of the rain and away from the mud and disgusting environment. Dad and mum used to get overly competitive. They'd end up screaming and yelling at these literal eight-year-olds kicking a ball around a field. I found it quite funny and comical at times, but the fact I had to go to every game, well, that wasn't funny. The bit I couldn't wrap my head around as I decided to go upstairs for a shower was the fact that mum and dad had allowed me to stay home alone, now, but they'd never let me stay home alone when my brother had a football game. I think deep down to them, they wanted me to go to support him. It wasn't that they genuinely worried or cared about me being left in the house alone. It was that they were just full-on sporty parents. My dad tried to guide me into cross-country and swimming when I was younger, but I was having none of it. I hated all forms of exercise, it just made me feel like crap, I hated pain and tried to avoid it at all costs. I guess you could say lazy, but I wasn't overweight and had a completely normal shapely body. I got a shower and chucked my jeans in the wash because my brother had ruined them splashing his mud all over from his shorts. When I got out the shower I realised that I was already home alone. Mum and Dad hadn't even said bye. They must have been in such a rush to drop my brother off that they had just left without telling me. It was kind of weird, I'll be honest. There was always noise in the house, some TVs or music. My younger brother is a nightmare to be around. Trust me, you know he's in the same building if he is, 100% of the time. Even when he's sleeping. He damn well snores louder than a truck passing on a highway. It's insane. I went to dry myself off and put on my pyjamas for the rest of that evening. I think it was around 6 or 7pm, but it was already dark because it was winter. It was still raining heavily outside and it was really, really depressing to look out the window. After I'd blow dried my hair, I went downstairs and decided to grab some food. 
I'll be honest, I wasn't the greatest cook and mum was still making me dinner between the ages of around 16 to 17. It was only when I became 18 that I moved out for college. That's when I ended up making my own meals. I went downstairs and made myself something random. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was like a sandwich and crisps or baked beans and eggs or something. Once I'd finished eating that, I put on the TV and decided to just relax for the rest of the evening. Mum or Dad hadn't said when they'd be back, but in my mind I took a logical guess at at least 11pm by the latest. I mean, think about it. What restaurants are open till gone midnight? Virtually zero. And my parents weren't the kind of people to go clubbing. They're in their 40s at this point. After I'd finished eating my made-up concoction dinner, I chucked all my stuff in the sink, my plates, bowls and cutlery, and decided to run the water for a bit and put in some soap. I left it to soak for a while and just went to relax on the couch and put some TV on. I'd been laying back on the couch for around 20 minutes, trying to put off doing the dishes, when all of a sudden the phone beside me starts ringing. No one ever called our home phone, and when I say that, I'm being 100% honest and truthful. No one. My parents didn't really have friends, and all of my friends and my brother's friends called our mobiles. The home phone was virtually pointless, so as a family we knew when it went off. It meant something was bad. Anxiety in me started to rise, but at first I thought just don't answer it. It was around 8pm at this point and I was thinking to myself who the hell could this be? The first call goes off and I just ignore it. It goes straight to answer and we have one of those phones where you can hear them leave the answer message once we haven't answered. All I can hear is breathing down the line. It was the creepiest shit I could ever tell you guys. I was scared for my life even though I knew that I was locked in my own house pretty safe. The breathing went on for a few minutes and then the line just cut up. After this, the phone started ringing again only a minute later. Again, the exact same thing happened and I didn't pick it up. The same heavy breathing and no words. Someone was there but they were just breathing down the line. The breathing didn't sound very good either. It came with some grunts and groans as if they were struggling to breathe, kind of like an asthma attack. Eventually, the second time they hang up, the phone cuts out and the home phone goes back to being normal. All of a sudden, my mobile starts vibrating in my pyjama pocket. I grab it and see that it's mum trying to call me. I answer the phone to a completely stressed out and panicking mum. Layla, I need you to go to Nan's now. Go to grandma's right now. Run there. Run now. An ambulance is on the way. What the hell? My heart sank. It was my nan that was trying to call me. Was it? What's wrong, mum? What's wrong? Just go, now. I put the phone down, grab my trainers, start sprinting out the door. It was 1.3 miles. I looked at it on Google Maps. I think I must have run it in around 20 minutes or 15 minutes. I was completely exhausted. When I got there, there was an ambulance outside her small bungalow. It was her the whole time. She'd had a stroke and was found laying on the kitchen floor. She was immobile, but somehow had managed to crawl her way up and grab the phone in the kitchen. There I was, having a panic attack, thinking a demon is trying to prank me in the night all home alone. When it was my grandma, almost dead, begging for me to save her life. Yes, she ended up surviving, but she lost most of her speech abilities and movement. She died a few years after this, and genuinely the whole encounter was terrifying and at the same time annoying that I didn't answer that phone.